In section 8.3, we're going to try and simplify radical expressions. Basically, what that means is we're going to pull out whatever perfect square we can or perfect cube we can and see what's left behind. So in order to do this, we're first going to use the product rule to simplify square roots. Then we're going to use prime factorization. Then we're going to simplify square roots of variable expressions. We're going to use the quotient rule to simplify square roots. And finally, we're going to try and simplify a few cube roots. If the square shown in the figure is an area of 12 square yards, then the length of the side is the root of 12. That way, root of 12 times root of 12, which is the area formula for a square, would give me 12, because I get root of 12 times root of 12 is root of 144, and the root of 144 is 12. So this is showing that if we knew that this was a 12 square yard dance floor, I guess it is, then the length of each side must be the root of 12. The problem is that if root of 12 is the length of each side, we can't really express that as a whole integer value. We learned in 8.1 how we could get a decimal approximation for this, but that's not what we want to do in this section. We don't want it to be a decimal approximation. We want it to be one part outside the radical, one part inside, by figuring out what the largest perfect square is that goes into this number. So, what we really want to do is find the simplified form. To simplify radicals, we're going to use product and quotient rules for radicals. So the product rule says that if I have something like 100 that can be broken up into 4 times 25 under the radical, I can break it up as radical 4, radical 25. For that reason, the 4 would come out as root of 4 equals 2, the 25 would come out as root of 25 equals 5, and 2 times 5 would give me 10, the same thing that would happen if I just initially took the square root of 100. So really this is just to show you that mathematically I'm allowed to do what they've done on the right. I'm allowed to break it up into two square roots that are being multiplied. No matter whether I do it as just root of 100 or if I do it as root of 4 times root of 25, I get to the same answer of 10. Similarly, if we wanted to look at how I could break down the root of 144, which we know to be 12, that's really the root of 9 times 16, the root of 9 is 3, the root of 16 is 4, and 3 times 4 gets me right back to 12. So for any non-negative real numbers, A and B, they have to be positive because they're under a square root. If I have the root of A times B, that's the same thing as the root of A times the root of B. In words, the square root of the product of two non-negative numbers is equal to the product of their square roots. A square root radical is in simplified form when each of the following statements is true. Firstly, except for one, the radicand has no perfect square factors. Our goal when we're simplifying these radicals is to take any perfect square factors out. No fraction appears in a radicand, and no radical appears in the denominator. So if we wanted to break down the root of 12 that we got previously, I could break that down into the root of 4 times the root of 3. The root of 4 is a perfect square. Specifically, it's the largest perfect square that goes into 12. A perfect square we can take out of the root sign by saying what the root of it is. The root of 4 is 2, so the 2 comes out of the root sign. What's left over under the root sign is this root of 3 that I cannot simplify other than turning it into a decimal. So basically, I want to break these roots down into a part that's a perfect square that I know how to take the root of, and a part that's a remainder that's going to stay under the square root symbol. Square in the figure, which we can see in the introduction to this section, as a length of root 12 yards. Really, we could write that as 2 root 3 yards. Simplify more difficult square roots. It's helpful to know the natural number perfect squares. 81 is a perfect square because it's the square of 9. 9 times 9 is 81. The first 20 natural number perfect squares are listed here. My recommendation is you have these numbers somewhere in your notes. So I did make available a sheet that you can print with common squares and cubes at the top of this unit in the module. That said, it might be easier just to write down each of these in your notes. You'd probably want to put alongside them what is being squared here. So really, just above them, you just have to count 1 to 20. 
So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 are the squares that are shown there. If I wanted to simplify the root of 27, I'd have to look on my list of perfect squares and see what the largest of them that goes into 27 is. So really, I have a number 36 that's bigger than 27. I know a bigger number is not going to work. So the first perfect square less than 27 is 25. If I do 27 divided by 25, I don't get a whole number. So I move to the next smallest square on my list. That would be 16. If I divide 27 by 16, I don't get a whole number. So I move to the next smallest square on my list, which is 9. If I divide 27 by 9, I do get a whole number 3. So 9 is the largest perfect square that goes in. We factor it into 9 times 3. We then know how to do the root of 9. The root of 9 just becomes 3. This 3 that's left under the root sign stays in the problem. So my final answer is 3 the root of 3. As a check, we can see if what we just got, 3 root 3 when squared, will get us back to the root of 27. So if I take 3 root 3 equals 27, then it should be that 3 root 3 squared also gets me to 27. If I square them separately, 3 squared gets me to 9, root of 3 squared gets me to 3, and 9 times 3 does equal 27. So this check shows me that this is a valid way to represent the root of 27. Here's three problems for me to do on the board. Trying to break down the root of 200, I look for the largest of my perfect squares that goes in. The largest perfect square that I should be able to find is root 100. I can then break this up into the root of 100 times the root of 2. The root of 100 is the perfect square we know that is 10. It leaves behind root 2. So my final answer for the simplified form of root 200 is 10 root 2. For root of 63, I'd want to break it up into the root of 9 times the root of 7. The root of 9 is my perfect square that I know that comes out as 3. And the root of 7 gets left behind. For the root of 20, I would break it down into the root of 4 times the root of 5. The root of 4 becomes 2, and the root of 5 gets left behind. Use prime factorization to simplify square roots. This is another method I would say to me, this is a little more difficult. If you're good with prime factorization previously, definitely it's a valid way to do it. But I personally think you're better off having the list of common squares or cubes and using that as your starting place on these problems. That said, if you want to simplify using prime factorization, it can be useful because basically any repeated um, factor can come out of the square root anytime it appears twice on your list of prime factors. So if, for instance, I wanted to simplify the root of 150, in order to do that, I'm going to try and figure out what are the factors of 150. The greatest perfect square factor of the radicand is not obvious in either of these choices, so we're going to try prime factorization instead. If I want to break down 150, it breaks down into 2 times 3 times 5 times 5. There's a lot of different ways to get there. I could say, well, 150 is really 5 times 30. Then I could break down the 30 into 5 times 6. Then I could break down the 6 into 3 times 2. That would get me to this 2 times 3 times 5 times 5. So the general idea is the number that starts out. You try and think of two things that will multiply to that and you keep branching off until you get down to things where the only way to multiply them is by the number one in themselves. In other words, you get to prime factors. Once I have this list of prime factors, I look for anything that's repeated, in this case, the five. That can then come out, if it's two of them under the root, one comes out outside of the square root. If it had been a cube root, if there's three under the root, one comes out, a fourth root, four under the root, one comes out, and so on. So when I take out that 5, since there's a pair of them, it becomes 5 times the things that stay under the root, 2 times 3, or root 6. I'm going to put the whole number in front of the multiplication, so my final answer would be 5 root 6. If we try and find the prime factorization of 95, the only way to multiply to 95 is 5 times 19. 
So we take that 5 times 19, we try and break down further, either the 5 or 19, we can't. Neither 5 or 19 is a perfect square, so this can't be simplified any further. This would just have to stay as the root of 95. Here's three problems for me to try on the board. The root of 72, I can break down into the root of 36 times the root of 2. The root of 36 is 6, so it becomes 6 root 2. 405, it's a little hard to see what goes in. Again, my recommendation would be to start with your list of perfect squares. So I'd try first 400 divided by 100. Doesn't go in evenly. Then I'd try 405 divided by 81. That does go in evenly. 81 times 5 gives me 405. So I would break it down into the root of 81 times the root of 5, which would give me a final answer of 9 root 5 when I took the root of 81. For the root of 147, that's really the root of 49 times the root of 3. Root of 49 is 7, so my final answer would be 7 root 3. Next thing we're going to do is simplify square roots of variable expressions. So if we have a variable expression that is an even number under square root, all that's going to happen is we're going to cut that even number in half when it comes out. So if we had x to the fourth, that's really x squared squared, or 4 divided by 2 would get me back to x squared. If we had x to the sixth, that's x to the third squared, or 6 divided by 2 would get me x to the third. So when we have an even number root, or a square root I should say, we just divide by that 2, whatever the power is on the, rat, on the um, variable underneath the root. That said, there could be times where that variable is not an even number. In cases like this where we're trying to break down x to the third, what I want to do is break it into the part that I can take the root of, which is the highest even power that would go in, and the leftover power. So in this case, I could break this down into x to the second under a root times the root of x. When I do that, and I break it down into the root of x squared times the root of x, I know how to find the root of x squared. It's a perfect square. Basically, I'm doing x squared divided by 2, which just leaves me with x to the first. That comes outside, and the root of x stays behind. So basically, for any odd number or odd power to a variable, you're going to take one less than that odd power as an even power and use the methods that we've used prior in order to take that out of the root symbol, and what will be left behind is the single power of the variable. So as a check, we can see if when we square x root x, we get back to x to the third. x squared is x, or I'm sorry, x to the power of 2 gives me x squared, root x to the power of 2 gives me x to the first, and x squared times x to the first does give me x to the third. So this check is showing that yes, this does work as a valid way of simplifying the root of x cubed. I'm going to wave to myself again to do these problems on the whiteboard. The root of x to the seventh, I can break down into the root of x to the sixth times the root of x to the first. At the root of x to the 6th really becomes x to the 6th divided by 2, which is x to the 3rd, and then the root of x remains. For 4x to the 15th under the root sign, I can break that up into the root of 4, the root of x to the 14th, the root of x. The root of 4 we know to be 2. The root of x to the 14th is x to the 14 divided by 2, or x to the 7th and then this root of x gets left behind. Finally, for root 500, that's not a perfect square, so I need to figure out what's the largest perfect square that goes into it. 100 is the largest perfect square that goes into it. So I can break this down into the root of 100 times the root of 5 times the root of x to the fourth times the root of x. The root of 100 is 10, the root of x to the 4th is really x to the 4 over 2, which is x squared. Then left behind is the root of 5 and the root of x. I want to multiply those two and leave them under the root sign. 
5 times x gives me 5x. So my final answer would be 10x squared, the root of 5x. When we're simplifying cube roots, we're using the same general methods. The key here is that we need to have 3 of something underneath the root for it to come out as 1. So again, having these perfect cubes in your notes is going to make it a lot easier to simplify these things. It's going to be useful in this lesson and in the next few lessons to come. If I have that list of perfect cubes, 8, 27, 64, 125, 216, 343, 512, 729, 1000, I can line that up with 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. For any real numbers, A and B, the cube root of A and B, I can break up into the cube root of A times the cube root of B. Or if it was written as a fraction, I could write it as the cube root of the top A divided by the cube root of the bottom B. Here's three more problems for me to try on the whiteboard. For these problems, you want to be looking at your list of perfect cubes. In the case of the cube root of 4,000, I should see that 1,000 is the largest cube that goes into this. So that means I can break this down into the cube root of 1,000 times the cube root of 4. Even though 4 jumps out at me as, oh, I know that's a perfect square, I can take the square root of that, doesn't help me at all when I'm dealing with cube roots. I can only look at things that are perfect cubes, not things that are perfect squares. So this is a perfect cube. 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10. So it comes out of the cube root as just a 10. This cube root of 4 needs to stay behind. When I try and break down the cube root of 24, I should break it down into the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 3. The cube root of 8 is 2, and I'm still left with the cube root of 3. For the cube root of 54, I can break that down into the cube root of 27 times the cube root of 2. The cube root of 27 is 3, so this becomes 3 the cube root of 2. If I wanted to simplify the cube root of 16, x to the third, y to the fourth, I'd want to break it down into really four parts. First, the cube root of 16, that I'd want to break down into the cube root of 8, cube root of 2. Then the cube root of x cubed, which I'd want to break down into the cube root. Or I'm sorry. With that, I can just leave it all under the cube root because it has a power that's a multiple of 3. It's y to the fourth that I need to break up into y to the third, which is a multiple of 3, times a leftover y. In this case, both 64 and 27 are perfect cubes, and the third is a perfect cube, so only on top will I have something left over. I can take the root of n to the third, but there'll be an n left over. So here's what these will look like. For the first one, I can break it down into the cube root of 8 times x to the third times y to the third, each of which is a perfect cube times 2 times y, which will be the leftover part which left behind. So in this case, cube root of 8 gives me that 2. Cube root of x cubed gives me just x, because 3 divided by 3 is an understood 1. Same thing happens with y. 3 divided by 3 is an understood 1. And then the leftover part that stays under the cube root is this 2y, which I couldn't turn into perfect cubes. If I'm doing it with the quotient one, I split the top and bottom. After I split them, I can break up the bottom into the cube root of 27, which is just 3, the cube root of n cubed, which is just n. The parts that I can take the cube root of on top are the 64, which has a cube root of 4, and n to the third, which has a cube root of n. That leaves behind the single power of n still under the cube root. So my final answer here would be 4n the cube root of n, divided by 3n. Final thing we're going to do here is these three problems on the board. When we break down these variables under the cube root, I want to find the largest multiple of 3 that's still smaller than this number. So the multiples of 3 go 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. If I go 3, 6, I've gone too far. So the largest multiple of 3 that goes into this number is x to the third. So I'm going to keep a cube root of x to the third there. It would then need to be multiplied by the cube root of x to the second, so that 2 plus 3 equals 5. That means I can break down this cube root of x to the fifth into this part I know the cube root of. It just becomes x. And what's left over behind 
the cube root of x squared. When I go to break down x to the 16th, y to the 8th, the largest multiple of 3 that goes in without going over is x to the 15th here. So I can break this down into the cube root of x to the 15th, which means I have left over just x to the 1st. The largest multiple of 3 that can go into 8 is 6, so I can break this down into y to the 6th under the cube root. If I take away 6 of the 8, that leaves y to the 2nd under the cube root. 15 divided by 3 gives me x to the 5th. 6 divided by 3 gives me y to the 2nd. Then under the cube root is the leftover part, the single power of x, y to the 2nd. Finally, when I'm doing negative x to the 88th, it might take me a second to figure out what the largest multiple of 3 that goes into that is. It's x to the 87th. So this becomes the cube root of negative x to the 87th times the cube root of x to the first, so that 1 plus 87 equals 88. If I put into my calculator 87 divided by 3, it should tell me 29. So this would come out as negative x to the 29th, the cube root of x. Note that even though I made the negative go with the first parentheses and come out of the problem, it'd be fine if you instead said the negative gets left behind under that cube root. Whether this term is negative or that term is negative, they both multiply together to give you a negative overall.